Welcome to Frontlines, the NRA Life of Duty series sponsored by FN. It's been my great privilege to serve our country and share the stories of the heroes I know. That's what Frontlines is all about. Heroes who serve to protect us overseas and here at home. There are unsung heroes serving on front lines you never hear about from the so-called mainstream media. Places like Kurdistan, a semi-autonomous region in northern Iraq, far north of Baghdad, and well removed from what you've probably seen before. Life of Duty correspondent Chuck Holton reports from his visit in early May 2012. Chuck's a close personal friend, a former Army Ranger. He'll take us to a region you've probably never considered one that's leading the charge for change in the Middle East. After years of being the most dangerous country on the planet, you'd think any part of Iraq where it was actually safe to walk the streets at night would at least garner a mention in the press. The subtle message being given by the mainstream media, however, is that the whole of Iraq is just as bad today as ever. When most people think of Iraq, they think of Baghdad, and Baghdad equals car bombs. When they think of car bombs, they think of dead and wounded American soldiers. Therefore, when people think of Iraq, they think of dead Americans. But if you drive north of Baghdad a few hours, you'll find an American success story that doesn't make the news. Its name is Kurdistan. This semi-autonomous region of northern Iraq is booming but not in the bombs and bodies sense. Here, construction cranes have become something of a national symbol of progress, and the capital city, Erbil, is starting to look more like Dubai than Baghdad. In fact, it started from 2004, because uh, after 2003, the freedom of the Iraq and Saddam regime had been removed. Nazwad Hadi is the current governor of Erbil. The first time the budget directly from Baghdad coming to the Kurdistan, and Kurdistan decided how to plan, how to spend this budget. New construction is everywhere, and the streets are packed with cars, most of which are nicer than mine. When I walk on the street, it seems like I'm walking not in Iraq, okay? It's very clean, it's very safe. If you compare it with south of Iraq, with Basra and Baghdad, there is a lot of checkpoints, there is a lot of garbage, there is a lot of traffic. You don't feel comfortable there. There is about $11 billion in the private sector, which is invested in that now. You can see in the, in the city, there are hotels, malls, projects, housings, many uh, factories, many things. It's new in development. American warriors played a large part in making this forgotten front line in the war on terror the safe haven that it is today. Since biblical times, this region has been plagued by war. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the 1920s, Kurds began a push for independence. This gave rise to the Peshmerga, Kurdish guerrilla fighters whose name means those who face death. Our translator and fixer, Mohammed, drove us two hours from Erbil to a small village only a few kilometers from Halabja, the ill-fated site of the most deadly chemical attack in history. As fate would have it, we arrived on a very special day the annual festival held in that village to honor the Peshmerga fighters who have died defending their country. This small village in the mountains of Kurdistan is the birthplace of the Peshmerga. And these men here are the heroes of the Kurdistan army. They're the men who have fought for the last 25 years to make Kurdistan a safe place for investment, business, and infrastructure. They often clashed with Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein whose campaign to Arabize northern Iraq resulted in a genocidal policy toward the Kurds, in which more than 40,000 died and more than one million were displaced. A commotion in the crowd heralded the arrival of Barham Saleh, the former prime minister of Kurdistan. He was imprisoned and tortured by Saddam's bath party before escaping to the UK. I asked Sally to describe the scene we were seeing in front of us. This particular area was the command center of the Kurdish resistance, and it was uh, subjected to a uh, terrible onslaught by the Iraqi military using chemical weapons. The genocide campaign was conducted here. This was a totally devastated wasteland. International calls for action rose to a crescendo in 1988 after news broke that Hussein's bath party had gassed the Kurdish village of Halabja, killing thousands of civilians. 
This massacre became a large part of the justification for the first Gulf War. The Kurds emerged from the mountains that had been their sanctuary to fight alongside coalition troops. After Iraq's surrender to the coalition in 1991, the dictator Saddam Hussein continued to brutalize the Kurdish people. I don't think most Americans can imagine what it would be like to live under a dictator. You cannot speak about Saddam's policies at all. If you did, they would catch you. And without a trial, they would execute you. There was one guy. They captured him and took him out of the military and threw him off of a mountain. A national fortune of oil and natural gas exists under Kurdish territory. Hussein did what he could to control those resources, and the Peshmerga fought back. You were a, an auto worker in Detroit for, for how long? 20 years. For 20 years. And, you, and before that, you fought with the Peshmerga, or after? Before, uh, before. about in Asia, I'm with the Peshmerga uh -huh. in 1988. Okay, and so you came here today just to be with your friends and celebrate? Sure. In late 1991, the United States declared a no-fly zone over Kurdistan and launched a humanitarian operation to send help to the hundreds of thousands of refugees who had been driven from their homes by the fighting. 1991, with the no-fly zone area, which in fact protected the Kurdish area from the Saddams, because it, it provided a comfortable area for the Kurdish people till 2003, when the American troops with the coalition forces, they started to, to, to how to eliminate the Iraq. These were allies of the United States uh, in the war of liberation against Saddam Hussein. And we remember the sacrifices of the Americans uh, who have come from afar to help us overcome Saddam Hussein. What we have did not come about easily. It was the sacrifices and the commitment of these veterans who made it happen. And remember, these Peshmergas are the story of Kurdistan. These are the heroes. These are the heroes of Kurdistan. In the last 20 years, the Peshmerga have become one of the best allies of the United States military here in Iraq. And they've been a big help in the war on terror. All Iraqis praise the help of the U.S. military for fighting the terrorists and al-Qaeda. Up to now, the U.S. military has been fighting beside and training our Peshmerga troops. Even after the hurried departure of American troops last December, Violence in many of Iraq's major cities has continued unabated as radical Islamists sow destruction wherever they can. At the beginning, we focused on how to providing the security because it's the main issue, because how to protect our people and how to protect our business also in the region from the Al-Qaeda and the terrorist activity. Sectarian violence is unheard of in this region, and even petty crime is relatively low. It's early morning here in this suburb of Erbil called Ankawa. The people that live here are almost exclusively Christian, many of whom fled from Baghdad and other areas of Iraq and came here for one reason, because you can walk the streets at night. Kurdistan is now the only Middle Eastern country besides Israel whose schools teach a religion-neutral curriculum. This is astounding since the area is more than 90% Muslim yet they do not require students to learn Islamic precepts to graduate. Because of this peaceful, pluralistic worldview, Christians and other non-Muslims from around the Middle East are flocking to the area. Here, you have Muslims, you have Christians, you have Yadzi, you have people of all different uh, races, Arab and Kurdish and everybody, but they all live together uh, peacefully. Uh, they, you don't have the the, the the divisions that you have in the yes, south. Yes, yes. Why do you think it's different in Kurdistan? Uh, it was it was problem before. Before it was a problem between uh, Barazani's uh, group and Taliban group. Before it was. But now it's safe. Okay? Now the people start to understand what's going on. Nihad Koja is Erbil's mayor. For over a thousand years, many nationalities have lived in Kurdistan, not only Kurdish people. Here, people have their own religions and own directions. And as long as they are living here, among other people, they will be free and live together. Everywhere you go here, you can tell that there's a lot of money flowing into this area because a lot of, it must be a lot of new investment. 
Seems like all the vehicles are fairly new. They're in good shape, you know. A short cab ride from our hotel brought us to a modern mega mall, complete with stores selling everything from housewares to Levi's to coffee. Attached to the mall was a good-sized amusement park. And as the night wore on, the crowd got larger and larger. Aside from the music, which was Turkish pop, it could have been any state fair in America. It all felt very familiar, except this was Iraq, and that made it surreal. If the U.S. Army or American government had not helped, our development here would not have happened. We've never lost a single American in Kurdistan, not one. That speaks to the partnership between the American military and the Peshmerga. The future for Kurdistan, what, what will become of it? We are focusing how to reconstruct in our region. We are never looking for the revenge against anyone. Opposite, we are looking for the bright future, how to rebuild our country and how to make such an uh, atmosphere area to live together. Because we know, in fact, we are living among the Turkish, Arab and the Persian. We want to tell ourselves and the world, lest we forget, what we have achieved is significant and we should not ever allow tyranny to revisit us again. Chuck, great report. Thanks. Give us a sense for where you see things headed in Kurdistan. You know, there are people that aren't just Muslim, the, and everyone lives together in peace, they work together. And so my question to them was, how can this be? How does this happen? And they said, we're so tired of war, and we've realized that it, it's much better to get along, it's much better, and we don't have, we, we just don't permit the kind of sectarian violence that goes on because uh, everybody wants it to stay like it is. We know we've got a good thing and we want to keep it that way. Thank you for going back and covering that ground you and I have been over before. That's your Frontline Report, sponsored by FN on the Life of Duty Network.